Are you in Are fashion? You in fashion? Fashion. Did you see what she's wearing? The top <gasps> shoes. I'm Sonia Sly. My heels are killing me. Um, but I was told I have a backstage pass. You will need to get the right pass to get behind me, Pam. Look, I'm I need sorry. to go. Code red, code red, code. We have a situation. I'm taking you inside the fashion industry to discuss trends, the reality behind the glamour, and the highs and lows of a fast-paced industry that never stops. There's no mystery that Fashion Week events around the world are all about selling clothes. The apparel industry is a business worth around $3 trillion globally. So whether you shop high-end or low, you're buying into the business of fashion. Now, if you listen to the last episode, then you'll know that there are politics when it comes to those coveted front row seats. So who are these people and where do they come from? And are their roles and voices in the industry vital? Well, I met up with three of the international delegates at New Zealand Fashion Week to discuss buying power, why the term blogger is a dirty word, the shifting online world for two style influencers, and why Asia has left behind its social media platform Weibo and jumped on the Instagram bandwagon, but they've yet to hitch a lift on the slow fashion train. I started at David Jones when I was 21. Meet Tennille Ferguson. And she's the buying manager of women's wear for Australian department store David Jones. When I meet her, it's a bit of a rush between buying appointments and runway shows. While it might sound glamorous, her foot into the industry began with men and their <clears throat> smalls. I was the assistant buyer in men's socks and <laughs> men's underwear while I was studying a fashion course. And then I, um, I stayed at David Jones for eight years. And then I went to London for two years and then went back to Australia but worked for another department store. And then I've just come back to David Jones six months ago. And the way to make it successfully as a buyer is work your way up. So I think you need to get into a, a brand or a store that you can see yourself working in long term and work your way through and then you can kind of get an understanding of the entire business because there are lots of facets to buying and I think unless you have that full understanding it's hard to make the decisions at the top. It's a numbers game so I think a lot of people think that the fashion buying is you know about all the fashion shows and the creative side of it but it's actually a mix of you know managing a business and delivering key financials as well as I suppose understanding the customers needs and having that creative understanding of the designers and aesthetics. Is there a lot of pressure on you to get it right for the David Jones brand? You're selecting individual pieces like that need to kind of fit side by side with basically competing brands really. Yeah exactly. I think it's challenging from a, a an aesthetic perspective is it going to look good on the floor are we going to be catering for all of the customers needs but the bottom line is how well does the department trade and that's a true indicator of how successful you are I've come over here to kind of you know get my head into the market and kind of understand more about what the New Zealand customer is looking for and what the variances are compared to our Australian market on that note then what are the variances in terms of aesthetic the New Zealand woman does dress differently to the Australian woman um, she likes more relaxed silhouettes um, darker colors obviously because of the weather over here Meatwear and outerwear are really key, whereas they're not as prominent in Australia, so we're majority dress businesses, but over here, outerwear and separates are definitely more popular. Would you think that anything that you've seen here would work in the Australian market at all? Yeah, yeah, potentially. Like potentially. Who, for instance? A designer like Wynn, Wynn um, Hamlin. Yes. I think he's got a bit of an international style about it, you know, for that sophisticated woman, so it's not truly, I think, New Zealand in the aesthetic, but I think it does have some really strong New Zealand components to it, but I do think mm. it would translate to the broader market. The the market is open now. Isn't the market it? is completely open, mm. but I think every market has its own handwriting, and I think that's what's unique about New New Zealand. It does have its own handwriting, as do Australian brands, as do I suppose English brands. What is it that you're primarily looking for, and, and I mean, do you find that it's a, like competitive just from your point of view? Because I mean, obviously, like you're looking for multiple brands yeah. to stock in a department store. We only have a certain amount of floor space, and we need to make sure that floor space is productive. So we want to be putting in the best assortment of brands in there to satisfy our customers' needs. What we're looking for brands to take on is a point of difference. So a brand that's offering a different aesthetic from what I currently already have within the assortment. The price and value equation is really key. Does that brand present? Um, 
some good uh, value to our customer and also the brand awareness, particularly within the designer space where they are elevated price points, making sure that the customer has actually heard of the brand or, you know, it's on that up and coming, but it's just about to break through. Grabbing onto brands that are too early can be a little bit dangerous for us. Is that because their aesthetic is likely to change? Yeah, I I think within the designer space, because it is more expensive price point, people kind of want to know if they've bought a dress, what, who the designer is and that they have paid that higher price point. People want to you know, wear it loud and proud and it to be recognised. So that brand awareness piece is very key. And even for David Jones as a brand, how do you feel like the, the approach for them and the branding has changed for David Jones, like maybe over the past like five years? Because everything in the market continues to shift. I think it's really key for every brand to evolve in time in order to be relevant. I think the, the rise of social media and the online players has really created quite a big impact and and I suppose challenged customers that were historically David Jones or department store shoppers. They now have a lot of other um, uh, opportunities in the marketplace to shop, so we don't have that domination anymore. Has it been hard? No, it's made us stop and kind of understand what our customers' needs are. And we were forced into then, I suppose, be a little bit more flexible and agile in our approach. So from a personal point of view, what were some of the highlights for you at Fashion Week? The highlight for my week was the graduate show. So I think there was some outstanding talent emerging from those designers and yeah, definitely key pieces that I could see in my wardrobe, Um, but really exciting to see, I suppose, talent at that level coming through. And what trends are you feeling like you're seeing in Australia at the moment? We're going to spring summer as well, obviously. There's a new romantic trend, which is very frilly and, you know, beautiful, lots of lace and Edwardian kind of high necks and long sleeves. There's a midnight glam trend, which is kind of, you know, an evening wear 80s trend with like, you know, velvet lux, lots of sequins, um, really like special fabrics. And then there's a Tropicana trend, which we're coming, seeing coming through, which is lots of bright colours. So perfect for high summer and also spring racing, which is key in Australia. Um, lots of hot pink and red. I've always been drawn to Australian fashion, like in the summertime, that swimwear, and I feel like it's a fresh take on what's happening in the States. That made me curious as to like what's going on in New Zealand. Is it is it have Australian ties or is it kind of doing its own thing? And it's very, been very interesting being here. Like I've been blown away by all the street style, how just directional it is. It's like, it's really amazing. Five years ago, Mary Singh launched her website Happily Grey. Born in Texas and now based in Nashville, her approach to style focuses on texture, fabric and structural elements. She works full-time as an online stylist and influencer, but the world of blogging has changed dramatically with technology and especially the growth of social media platforms. So now the term blogger almost feels like a dirty word. Or is it? Yeah, I usually say influencer just because uh, blogging does have a negative connotation. There's so many bloggers, it's so consumed, but you've got some people that are doing it as a fun project and some people that are actually trying to, you know, monetize a business. And so it does have a negative connotation. It can be considered like a vanity project. Um, I always just try to hope, hopefully it comes across as like really about design driven and about the clothing while also having that personal touch to it that blogging has. But beyond the designer clothes, she's just an ordinary gal. Or so I found out when I asked her. What's something that you wear in your downtime that you would want? <laughs> no, no, you know, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I wish my fiance was here. He would, <laughs> he would know exactly how to answer that. Um, I wear almost religiously every night um, blue plaid flannel oversized pants that are probably from when I was 11. <laughs> and I still wear them because they're so soft because they've been washed so many times. I'm getting married in two weeks and we're riding our own valves and we just exchanged valves the other night and he put those pants in his valves. (laughs) I was like, oh dear. Where you're from, are you kind of considered a little bit unusual? Like, Yeah, for the South, definitely. Yeah, Yeah, being from Texas, I live in Nashville. My style is a little bit more like androgynous, I would say, than sweet. I definitely have more of a street menswear look. And that's what sets her apart from other influencers. She has a following of over 800,000 on Instagram, but before fashion, Mary was actually a... Nurse. I went to school for nursing and studied studied medicine and... I know, right. ...worked in critical care for four years, and I love taking care of people, but it was at the time that I wanted a creative outlet, just... It was gaining more exposure, this whole new market, and there was a whole avenue, a whole other world of marketing through a blogger, so... 
So how have things changed over that past five years? Because influencers, mm -hmm. you know, using, you know, having a YouTube channel, do you have your own yeah. YouTube channel? And, and how important is that? Yeah, I know we're launching that. I would say in the next two to three months, um, it, YouTube channel is vital. The way this has transitioned the last three or four years, it used to be about like the beautiful high res imagery. And I think now everyone's so consumed with that. I think people want more real. They want more real time, what's actually the behind the scenes, what's actually happening. They and want to so, see more personality. Yeah. Yeah, so the iPhone snap actually, for a lot of times for me, performs better. I mean, you do have to have that high-res imagery for the brand, for the campaigns, but the little like one-off videos, they generally perform the best because they're real. They're, the, the readers feels like, feel like they're there with you. How would you describe yourself? I can't believe that you, you did nursing. That's so yeah, different. It's, it's like a completely different day. world. It's night and day. Um, I, I would like to think I'm pretty easygoing. Um, I'm, I'm not... I, I'm not really high maintenance. I hope my fashion like translates to that. I've always loved a mix, a, a contrast. I always love like feminine and menswear, sweet and edgy. While I do get to like wear amazing clothes and I'm always like changing outfits, I hope there's like such an ease to it when they meet me. So, if there was an emergency at Fashion Week on the runway, would you feel like you, <laughs> you know, would rush to the scene? Would that be a natural instinct for you? Like if, <laughs> well, I don't know. Oh, like if someone like, like a, fell over with like yeah, a heart attack, no, or actually, really, you would know what yeah, to do. Yeah, no, that's. I feel like being a nurse, that's like in my blood. I actually was just in a coffee shop, like probably five or six months ago, and a girl collapsed over from low blood sugar. Taking care of people was the one thing I loved about nursing, and that's what I missed the most. Um, hospital politics are a whole other thing, mm. but. I think I'll always have that in me. I, I love to take care of people. What do you think are some of the problems to do with like the facade of the fashion industry and now being part of it? I guess there is that whole side of things where it's like, well, it's not very real. It's, you know, for the yeah. people who, you know, have a lot of disposable income and, you know, there's right. a whole kind of facade that comes along with the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. Are you, you know, is that ever a contentious thing for you that you ever struggle with? Being able to present it in a way that it translates to readers that it's not that is the key. Because for me, it really, it really isn't that. I think mixing highs and lows, you know, have something from Topshop or Zara mixed with like this really coveted Balenciaga boot and really having a story to what you're doing, I think it gives light to it so it doesn't seem so like superficial and when we shoot clothes, it, it truly is about the clothes and we, with, when I work with different photographers, we go, we go through this kind of set way to shoot it to where we really capture the clothing in like many different lights and how many brands are you working with at the moment we usually at one at one time we usually have about 10 to 15 campaigns on kind of ongoing i have a team back home that helps me a team um, you've got a team well kind of growing <laughs> growing i have an assistant um i have another part-time assistant that's off-site and i have a manager and an agent we all kind of work together throughout the schedule and booking stuff and travel so and even even though it looks like you're doing this on your own, it's, because obviously you're the face of the brand, yeah. there's actually a team behind a you. Moving effort, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. I mean, how many, how many sure. fashion weeks have you been to this year, and where about? Um, so, let's see. I always do February, March. I do um, New York, London, uh, Milan, and Paris twice a year, and usually I'm involved in Nashville in some way. I would love to be so involved. So they've got their own fashion scene. Yeah. What does yeah, that look like? Too. Nashville Fashion Week is about eight years old, I want to say. Um, seven or eight. It's incredible. Uh, it started very, very small and they've got some like incredible people behind it that are just like pushing it up. It's fun. Nashville's the second fastest growing city in the nation. It's like got this massive um, creative hub to it and this fashion week is really the main one I've done outside of the, the four big ones outside of um, New York, London, Milan, and Paris. What are the expectations for you when you do go to those international fashion weeks? What do brands expect from you? New York is, is full on it's an animal. It's chaotic. It's we usually have several projects on that we're shooting for. Like we, we've teamed up with either designers or brands, and so we're shooting campaigns. Or um, in between that, we're going to shows. There is all sorts of like meet and greets. There's events. There's parties. It's generally like 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. Sometimes, sometimes later, and that's about eight days of that nonstop. Um, I mean, does that get tiring? I mean, yeah, do, and, sure, and do you, sure. are you ever like, I'm just so over it? But obviously, you you know, yeah, it's not something I, you can say. I mean, I, I I get tired, of course, but New York has an energy about it. It's so fun seeing someone's collection that they've spent years working on in 60 seconds. 
has, I mean, that's, it's an incredible experience. I, my first um, time I went to New York and got to see like actual New York fashion runway was like, I'll, I'll never forget it. So I think that energy is what kind of keeps you rolling. And I mean, are you meeting the designers and things yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, backstage before the shows, um, usually like some sort of interview after they'll do um, parties that, that evening. So it's it, it's an amazing because you really do have that FaceTime. Marissa Webb is one of my favorite designers. Actually, some of this that you have on reminds me of that. And she's like one of my first ex experiences with ba backstage. And I remember seeing her and just being like, and watching her go through and style all the girls before the final, before they took the runway was was really cool. What are your thoughts on slow fashion? Because I, I guess America is an animal for fast mm -hmm. fashion. I mean, they're probably the ones who sort of like generated, you know, got the machine really moving uh -huh. on fast fashion. But yeah, I mean, what's the movement like in the States compared to here? Because a lot of new young designers, you know, they have, they're in the position right now where they can start to change the direction of the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about sort of like small collections and, right. you know, it's like yeah. taking their time and making sure that the process mm -hmm. is ethical and transparent. Yeah. I mean, I think that's refreshing now, now that we've, with all this like mass production and it's like as fast as you can get it out as fast as the trends are turning over I think um, that ethical like thought to de like really a lot of attention to detail is really nice I think it feels special and intimate rather than this like mass production of it and it also creates a really strong brand identity like, you know, I won't quit my writing so as writing is also a, a, a perspective is sharing it's also a critique so you cannot lose that battlefield one of the the thing that we try to engage more into is video. Because like David Wong is a fashion columnist for Hong Kong magazine Jet, among others. And like Mary, he's also a style influencer who goes under the tag, I feel cool. Now, before you screw up your face, David is actually very down to earth. And he tells me Instagram has recently taken Asia by storm. He's still growing his audience and says it's small, but it sits around 28,000. So I guess it's like, uh, the coming of age is like you have to engage your audience more, but not just with your perspective, not just with your uh, a critique, but also with a story. Story is so important. Yes, like everyone should have a story. So I love this Chanel jacket, I love this Chanel handbag, but what's the story behind it? Yeah. And if I wear it, do I have a story attached to it? David was brought to New Zealand by a multi-brand online designer platform called MyMM. And it's a site that's also about top-tier influencers sharing their style and tips. David started blogging around six or seven years ago and says social platforms have changed the game for style influencers, opening up doors to everyone, which makes it an incredibly competitive market. In terms of influencer market in, in Asia, there are a lot of good female bloggers and female influencers and there are a lot of competition there but in Hong Kong or in other Asian countries like China then not that quite a lot of guys or gentlemen's bloggers that are really getting into the business of it so I guess I'm lucky to have this chance to do this kind of thing uh, but now Instagram is such a big thing so, so it's taken is, off in Asia. It's taken off a, a huge. It's taken off huge, hugely in in Asia. So we all go for Instagram and no more writing, just taking good pictures and doing good content such as video. At, wow. On, on so you think um, people can gain followers and get a lot of traction on Instagram without even having a blog? Or I, a I, I do think so because a lot of people asking us now as an influencer to provide good pictures, right, and good writings. It's sad. I mean, that, it what? is really sad. It is. But now all they ask for is, oh, maybe you have a great picture you have just a few words and that's it. I, I mean in terms of like where the industry can move and ha like in terms of like critique because yes. I think there needs to be more critique in the yes. fashion industry. Yes. How is that possible if everything's just about pretty pictures now? Yes I, I guess it's like a two-way sword. You know, the one way it is the, the entry of every soul low so to speak that you have a good skill of photography yeah. photography or you have good pictures and you have good looks and then you can get into the game right so it's democratic it's good it's good everyone can get in the game but on as, as you said once you get in the game for some time content the thing that you stem for your perspectives shows so if you don't get a perspective on fashions or you don't have anything 
back up your good pictures. Yeah, so, I mean, do you then try and um, engage your followers and have something to say in the looks that you choose to post? Yeah, I, I guess it goes both ways. Okay. I still do a lot, I uh, still do my magazine writings, okay. so I still have some things to say, so to speak. What is happening in terms of trends and everything in Hong Kong? I've been there recently. Thank and, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Hong Kong has, like, people have amazing style, but everybody loves fashion, yes. you know, because, but there are so many options for people. Yes. So, yeah, what, what is happening in Hong Kong in terms of trends now? I, I guess, you know, Hong Kong is getting in a very confused interest. Like, Do you think so? Yes, uh, yes. Because we have too many choices sometimes. You have luxury brands, you have high brands, you have very known brands. And that people, of course, will try to get to it, the brand, the hands on it. But for the people that ho- doesn't have that kind of money, we luckily we still have that fast fashions. We have you know a low me- to medium range fashions that we can a lot of choices to choose. But unlike Japan, which has its very strong fashion identity, Hong Kong is still finding its feet. So it's all about luxury brands nestled between high street stores and local labels. I guess what missing in Hong Kong is uh, we are still very brand conscious. We are still very you know trying to figure out okay what to show off this time you know is it the price tag it's not like Japanese that we we, we are still at the very entry level of mixing match we know the trend is what colors and what fabrics and what looks will be hot in the coming season and we want to try to get that in the middle of it we are still very young and not sure how to create our own looks or our own style Hong Kong is getting there but it's still a little bit brand conscious with any price tag. Yeah, that's hard because, I mean, that I've never seen the hunger for shopping that I have seen in Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> where, you, know, it's, you have an immediate consumer market and everybody yes. Yes. is carrying lots of bags like all the time. It's yes. just like that's what people do in Hong yes. Kong free, in their spare time. Yes, yes. We are lucky that we have a lot of shopping opportunities and shopping outlets that we can, you know, be easily accessible with. Pretty much, you know, you can just shop, shop, shop and buy, buy, buy every moment of the day. Yeah, I mean, it's ingrained in part of the, the DNA of what makes Hong yes, Kong. Yes, especially when the shops, because in Hong Kong, after work, that you can still have that kind of luxury and time to go shopping. It, it's, it's a heaven, but also it's like hell sometimes. Sometimes you overspend a lot. And you really did buy something that you don't need. Well, do yes. you think everyone does it there? Yes, especially when the fast fashion is going so great and, and the cost has been so low that you can have that kind of luxury, have op- having a lot of more options than you have before. Mm. It's a modern fairy tale that we should have a lot of things, but actually we don't. So we is your wardrobe bursting at the seams? I try to control myself, yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm not that brand conscious at all. Okay, for you, no. it's all about the look. So different yes. places you shop high and exactly, low. Exactly, exactly. Of course, there's some looks or some fashion items that does, you know is hot, but somehow I can okay always have other alternatives. Yeah, this is a bit of a cheeky question, but what's the most you've spent on a on an item of clothing? Biggest one is like uh, a, a two thousand US dollars. The most expensive for me is that I, I will not go beyond that. And you wear the item a lot. You know, of course, when you spend that right. much, you want to have that good investment return, right? So you gotta wear, but you cannot wear it all a lot. What was it? Day. What was it? It was a jacket, I guess. Oh. It was a jacket, and then the one tips I always get is don't buy the fashion key pieces of a season. Buy something you know that after this year, next year, you will come out from your wardrobe and it still look good. So I would tend to buy more classic items, like, you know, a classic blazer that can take you everywhere, even though it's expensive. In Hong Kong, are people concerned about the impact of how fashion affects the environment? We're not big as other countries, like, for example, New Zealand. I think it's really hard for a place like Hong Kong because everywhere you go, it's set up for people to shop continuously. Yes. So that, that is the, the movement of the culture that's yes. ingrained in, in the place. We're getting better now because of the, there are some programs that are from government, from other from city centres that you can actually recycle clothes and that and also educating even my, my mother knows how to recycle clothes. But 10 years ago, we don't have that concept at all, especially in China, in Hong Kong. Our Chinese also have this thinking that we should wear new clothes every time. So that's why you won't see a big vintage 
market in China, in Hong Kong. Well, Chinese have mm-hmm. a, a superstition about old things, yes, that yes. they bring bad luck. Yes, so there's, yeah. yeah, of course, that hasn't yes. been cultivated, that idea to recycle. Yes. Back in the old days, we used to like, just throw it away. Really getting better now. But, you know, that could be an opportunity for Western countries to go over there and buy a whole bunch of, you know, used items yes. and bring them back and, sell, and recycle them, you know? Yes, yes. You've been at New Zealand Fashion Week. I mean, we're sitting outside, yes. Oh, yes. you know, and it looks for autumn, winter next year primarily. Yes. What's the feeling that you get about New Zealand fashion from what you see? Well, it's my first time here in New Zealand, especially Fashion Week, and it's amazed me a lot. You guys do have a lot of a very uh, international silhouette and, and drapings, and this is really fantastic. Back in our uh, old concept, we thought New Zealand are more like very culturally individualism. You may not have that kind of global, uh, global fashion vibe, but actually I'm totally wrong. So uh, you guys have, the, especially the graduation show, a lot of new looks and new silhouettes. And when you put that graduation works next to shows in Tokyo or next to shows in Paris, I'm sure they still do very, very competitive. You've been listening to My Heels Are Killing Me, presented and produced by me, Sonia Sly, and engineered by William Saunders. This podcast is also available on iTunes and Spotify and now on Stitcher too. If you enjoyed this podcast, you also might like the new season of Black Sheep.